Good evening. This is Radio Free Bichelle. I'm Alphonse. Tonight, the pandemic of hate. I am a false, treacherous, and contemptible swine. This was shameful Israel, the wicked and disloyal, who hated good and loved everything evil, who then poisoned several rivers and fountains so that many lost their lives, for whoever used them died suddenly. Then every Jew was destroyed. Some hanged, others burned, some were drowned, others beheaded. Under conditions like these, there are people who deliberately take sides with the enemy and must be treated accordingly. In times of war, such people were shot. Treat them like the plague-spreading lepers that they are. You want to be put in isolation camps? That's where this is headed. You will have deserved it, and I'm all for it. The first quote I just read was from Guillaume de Machaut in 1349, during the Black Death, when the people in the town where he was decided that the Jews were responsible for the plague and murdered them. The second quote was by Arunas Velinskas, a Lithuanian public intellectual and a former parliamentarian, in September 2021. The third quote was from a Reddit discussion in Canada, also in September 21. The post was highly, extraordinarily highly upvoted, with many awards. I have never seen hate like this. I have never seen our leaders encourage us to divide and hate and avoid one another, to blame other people for threatening our lives. The closest I recall was following 9-11, when there was widespread blame of Muslims. But this, this is much worse. And the height of it is the vaccine mandates, the vaccine passports. I'm vaccinated, by the way, by choice, before all the madness began, but I shouldn't have to say that. Here's what it's like for someone who isn't. A Lithuanian man, Gluboko Lietuva, who joined Twitter specifically to explain what it was like for him and his wife, who declined the vaccine passport in his country. He says they've been suspended from their jobs. They can't return, and they wouldn't if they could because their co-workers are sending death threats. They can't get new jobs in their fields. They can't even enter the supermarkets to buy groceries because they're banned without the passport. They have to buy food from stalls on the streets. They need to fix their home, but they can't go into the hardware store, and they can't even hire someone to do the repairs for them. He writes, Despite hardship, we decided resistance is our moral path. We want our kids someday to feel pride towards us, not disgust. Freedom is fragile and we must defend it. If not us, then who? We do not stop you earning a living, though you stop us. We do not ban you from buying food and clothing, though you ban us. We do not hate you, though you hate us. We do not banish you, though you banish us. We do not wish death upon you, though you wish death upon us. And when the time comes as it inevitably will, when you too are banished by the ever-increasing arbitrary rules of the new authoritarianism, we will fight for your rights just as we fight now for ours, because we are all equal, and we all have equal right to exist in society. For me, this recalls the famous poem by Martin Niemöller. First, they came for the communists, and I didn't speak up, because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me, and by that time there was no one left to speak up for me. How have we come to this? How have we come to a time when we're willing to, to, to hate our fellow citizens and say that's moral and celebrate it? How have we come to the point where we can wish for the deaths of our fellow citizens, large numbers of us? I've heard hate from people I know. When the vaccine passport came in where I live, it was only for non-essential activities. You can go to the library without one. You can go to the grocery store without one, but you can't go to a restaurant. And I spoke to a friend and he thought it was a good idea. And I thought, oh, well, you know, because maybe it can keep people safer. But that's not what he said. No, he said, because then the unvaccinated will suffer. They will be punished, and that will encourage them to get the shot. Such hate. I didn't even know what to say. 
There are a number of interviews on YouTube with a Dutch psychologist named Matthias Desmet, D-E-S-M-E-T. If you search for that and his theory about mass formation, you can also find some articles summarizing it. You'll see what he has to say. He saw this coming before it happened. He made financial decisions in late 2019 because he felt that the public was on the verge of something like this. The pandemic was only the excuse. What he explains with his theory of mass formation, which is in a sense a theory of how totalitarianism happens from the bottom up, is that there are four conditions that lead to people joining movements like this. And these are familiar if you listen to my episodes on uh, totalitarianism, where Hannah Arendt talks about similar things, and with my talk about René Girard and scapegoats. The first of these conditions is social isolation, which has been increasing for a variety of reasons in the 1990s, and then with social media even more, and now with lockdowns even more still, to the point where many people have few friends or none. The second, he says, is a failure of sense-making, a lack of meaning in life. And we see people expressing that all the time. The third is free-floating anxiety. Free-floating means it doesn't have a target. People are just anxious. They feel that they're precarious or something's going to go wrong. And that's certainly the case in the economy and the incredible competition, which I've also talked about in previous episodes about the information economy and elite overproduction. And fourth, and finally, there's a sense of free-floating aggression and anger. And I think it's clear that we saw this well before the pandemic. And what Desmet says is that when all of these conditions are fulfilled, that people are feeling miserable, and they want to find a way out. If they're given a target and told, this is the source of your troubles, they may turn on that target. And with a feeling of self-sacrifice, a feeling of elation, of ecstasy, he says it's almost like a hypnotic state where people don't even notice the things that are lost. They don't notice the costs of their actions. They don't notice other harms that are happening in the world because they're just focused on that target that they blame for everything that's wrong. And that's when they become capable of great atrocities, he says. This parallels almost exactly René Girard's theory that I talked about in Contagion and Scapegoat, where there's strife in society and the distinctions have broken down and people are blaming each other, but then all of a sudden they turn as one on a single target, a group or an individual, and they scapegoat and destroy and expel that target. And then harmony is restored because they're all on the same side again. Desmet says, though, that not everybody signs up for this. He says that about 30% join the ecstasy. About 30% are effectively hypnotized. Another 40% go along. They're not ecstatic, but they follow the lead of the few. And the final 30% are opposed. They see what's happening, and they fight against it. He says there's no pattern that predicts who will be in this group. They come from all walks of life. They come from all political, philosophical, and religious backgrounds, but they unite against the tragedy they see unfolding before them. And often they, too, can become targets. I know the people who hate think they're justified. They think they're justified because they think they're right. They think they have the truth, and maybe they do. But then the people during the Black Death also thought they had the truth when they blamed the Jews, and they were wrong. Who are we to claim that we uniquely have the truth? Those who are most confident are often most in error. But even if they do have the truth, does that justify these kinds of behaviors? If we look back in history, is there any time that jumps out as being a good time when it was the right thing to do to blame a few people for what was wrong, to expel a group from society, to deny them participation, to deny their humanity, to describe them as enemies and vermin? Has that ever been the right thing to do? I can't think of a time. The second argument that they will make is that this protects the community. If we can make those few people go along, if we can all get vaccinated, then it will end the pandemic. But even if that were true, 
and despite all the virtues of the vaccine that persuaded me to take it, it isn't. Even if that were true, forcing people is not going to persuade them to come on side. Some of them will, but the cost of protecting the community is destroying it. If you hate people like this, if you treat them as second-class citizens and outsiders, how do you expect to have a community after that? What happens next time when you want people on your side to do the right thing? They won't join because you broke it. It's better to persuade. It's better to recognize that people have the right to make their own mistakes. It's better to realize that we as citizens are not judge, jury, and executioner to go and decide who's good and who's bad. It's better to have a society where we're all treated as equals and we all have access to due process. But there's the third reason. A third reason that is seldom spoken, which is that people hate because it feels good. Because they think they're so angry that they can't keep it in. Who could blame me for hating people who put my family at risk, they might say. Well, I will. I will, even though I've made the mistake so many times myself, and I'm sure I'll make it again. But hate is not bound to targets. It's like an energy that flows. Once you have hate, it spreads. Other people mirror it. Other people echo it back to you. It spreads. It shifts from target to target. Girard talks about this, how the scapegoat can first be one group and then another, as different scapegoats attract more and more people until finally the majority fixate on one target. Dismet says this too. He suggests that maybe the solution is to shift the target, the target of fear, the target of anxiety, away from the pandemic, away from the unvaccinated, and towards the rising totalitarianism that we see. Gerard's solution is different. His solution, in a word, although he doesn't use it, is love. It is to say that we need to understand that the scapegoat is innocent. And that's true too in the sense that we're all flawed, we're all guilty, and we're all innocent. The most frequent accusation I seen thrown at the unvaccinated is that they're stupid. What kind of society would we be if that were really true, if we would say that some people are endowed with intelligence, some people are endowed with stupidity, and the stupid should suffer? Or maybe we're lying about it. Maybe we don't really mean that they're stupid. Maybe we mean something else. But then, why are we saying the wrong thing? And I think that's the case. And I think it reveals a guilty conscience. We say they're stupid, but we mean something else. But if we really said the something else, we might look bad. So we just call them stupid. The point is, we can't afford hate. Hate won't protect us from the virus. Hate won't sustain the community that we claim we're trying to protect. Hate will only produce hate. Hate will only produce division. Hate won't solve the problems that cause the anxiety, the precariousness, the misery, the isolation that many people live in today. As Desmet says, those root causes are the things we need to address. But some people don't want those root causes to go away because they benefit. And we probably shouldn't hate them either for the same reasons. But the fact is, it's in their interests to find something else to distract us with, because then we might look at the the skyrocketing inequality in our society. Then we might look at the actual meaninglessness of many of our lives. Then we might look at the fact that progress seems to be failing. This is the theory of John Michael Greer, that all this insanity is because originally God died in the 19th century, and then we replaced God with a new God, the God of progress, the God of man. And now the God of progress is failing too. But whatever the root causes, right now, what we need to do is to stop the hate. Or I think there could be atrocities. That's not the only mention that I have seen of people calling for concentration camps for the unvaccinated. Concentration camps for their neighbors. Desmet says that it's only 30% 
that are basically hypnotized, that are participating in Gerard's scapegoat ritual enthusiastically. Another 40% are going along, and the reason the 40% are going along is because that first 30% are unified. They have one story. They have one project. And the final 30%, those who resist, those who don't want to go along with the consensus, because they're so different, don't tell a single story. And so they're not as compelling for those in the middle. So those of us who want to resist this must try to at least get along enough to stop this from happening, because the other thing Desmet says is that although you cannot persuade the hypnotized, you cannot reason with them, because if they accepted your reasons, then they would have to go back into the hell world of anxiety and anger and a lack of meaning. And they don't want to do that. And because they don't want to do that, they stick with the lie. They stick with the hate. But as long as there's resistance, they're less likely to do something terrible. He says that mass formation, that totalitarianism turns really bad, then the atrocities happen when everybody goes along. So as long as we resist, we can hopefully prevent that from happening. Maybe you think I'm exaggerating. Maybe you think I'm panicking. Maybe you think this time what we're doing is justified. It's a crisis. And besides, totalitarianism is about radical ideology. What's radical about protecting the health of the community? Totalitarianism isn't about ideology. There have been totalitarians of the left under Stalin and of the right, the Nazis, the fascists in Italy, the wartime Japanese. Totalitarianism is not about a particular set of beliefs. It's about how we treat people. Do we respect their dignity, their independence, their rights and their responsibilities and their freedoms as individuals? Or do we treat society as an organism or a machine, and every person is a part of that machine, a gear in the machine, and if the gear doesn't work, we discard it? Even if you were to build such a machine for a good purpose to protect the health of the community. The machine would then follow its logic. We would have built the totalitarian mechanisms needed to treat us into parts, even though it was built for a good purpose. That's not how it would stay. Because that's not what it is. The machine is amoral. The machine doesn't care about us. The machine uses us, and if it doesn't have a use for us, it destroys us. We have said for generations now, Never again. I grew up under the idea, never again. But in order for it to never happen again, we also have always known that it could happen here, and it could happen now. How much evidence do we need? If we wait until it's conclusive, all we will be able to say is, yes, it did happen. We let it happen. We didn't stop it. And then our descendants, a century hence, will be apologizing for the crimes that we committed. If we want to stop it happening, we have to stop it before the crimes. We have to stop it when it's not obvious. Treat them like the plague-spreading lepers that they are. If it were to happen here, if it were to happen now, wouldn't it look like this? This is Alphonse for Radio Free Bichelle, www.besedl.ca. Good night.